Hi, and uh, welcome to this video where we talk about the bag of words representation. So uh, let me try to motivate it first. So uh, if we let's say we want to do machine learning on text, for instance, we want to create a spam filter that can detect whether an email like the one I received here uh, is actually spam or a legit email. Right? And as you can see here, I guess as humans, I will quickly be able to detect that this is indeed uh, a spam email. Uh, but how do we use the machine learning models that we've seen so far to actually uh, classify this email as either text or regular email? So we'll try to describe at least the bag of words representation uh, for doing so. So here's another example of a, a spam email. And what is it that distinguishes these? And also you can see that these, these are different texts of different length. Uh, so, you know, what can we do with them? So detecting whether something is spam or real email, we would like to use supervised learning in particular. Uh, we typically have lots of labeled data. We have lots of training data that we can use. At least if you have created, say, one of these, out, let's say, Outlook, one of these other mail programs, uh, these programs allow the user to mark an email as junk. And whenever you do this, you know, the users have already reported these emails were actually spam. The users believe them to be spam, right? So, so you have lots of training data available where you know it's it's junk, and probably uh, you know even without users actually telling you that a real email is a real email, these are the ones that are not being classified as spam, and maybe also the ones that you reply to would typically be non-spam emails, right? So you have lots of labeled data, lots of emails that you know are spam, uh, and even more emails that you know are, are real data. Okay. So the data set that we would have for training such a uh, spam filter or classifier will consist of all these pairs where the first, like the feature vector or the, the input element coming from the input domain would be a document or text, an email text. And the label would be either spam or it's regular email. Right? So they have these two classes. It's just a binary classification problem like we looked at many times in the previous videos. So right, the goal is, of course, to take this tra training data that we already have, somehow use it to train a machine learning model that such that when we get a new email, uh, we can detect whether it's a spam email or a regular email. Okay. And of course, the, the labels, right, spam or regular email, we know how to handle. We just treat them as minus one and plus one, like we've done so many times before. Uh, and then at least this fits with the input that uh, all the models we've seen so far, they can accept. Now, the problem is at least that uh, all the models we have seen in, in these videos here, uh, they don't accept text input. So when you get an, an email like uh, the one I received here, uh, how can I take this email and represent it somehow in a format that the learning models we've seen, they can accept, right? So the problem is that this is not a feature vector, right? So all the algorithms we've seen, they expect feature vectors. And so the question is really, do we need to make custom-made algorithms just for text, or uh, is there a way of reusing uh, some of the, uh, the algorithms that we've already seen? And uh, so that's the try to try a task that we'll try to address here. How can we perhaps interpret text as a feature vector so we can use it? Uh, so, so the solution we were looking at is somehow find a vector representation uh, of text. Okay. So, so said a little bit more formally, we want to take any string or text and embed it into a vector in D dimension for some fixed D that we decide on beforehand, perhaps. Uh, so, so this is really, again, in this area of embeddings that we also looked at in the last couple of videos. Last couple of videos, we looked at these dimensionality reduction techniques. This is more like a representation question. How do we represent the text string as a vector so that we can feed in the vector into the machine learning models that we know? Uh, because if we can do so, right, then we can take all these learning algorithms that we've already seen and we can just use them to these vector representations of the text. So no need to reinvent uh, all of them. Okay, so, so that's the goal, right? And, and the idea, of course, would be that these vector representations, they should have all the information about the text that is needed for the learning task, right? So, so this should somehow still be allow us to distinguish spam emails from regular emails, right? So it's important that somehow these representations keep the information about the text that is, that is important. And let me start in this video, we'll look at the simplest representation called bag of words. Okay, so what is the bag of words representation of a text string? So let's say I have, this is another spam email that I received. So um, it says the following, right? It talks about Viagra and uh, probably they want to sell me this. 
So if I wanted to do a bag of word representation of this text, what would I do? So I want to create, create a feature vector, so a vector of a fixed length. And so now for simplicity, like let's say that all these words, they come from the English dictionary. So actually these people have been creative. If you look at the words very carefully, you'll see that some of them actually have Greek letters, probably because they're trying to get around the spam filler that I had. Okay, but but generally, let's just for simplicity assume that all of this uh, comes from the uh, from the English dictionaries, all the words in the in the text. Okay, so so they come from the English dictionary, and so now I want to make such a representation of my document. And what is, am I going to do? So the vector that I'm going to create will have uh, one entry for every word in the dictionary. Okay, so it's a very long uh, string, a very long vector, and it has one coordinate that kind of corresponds to every word in the English dictionary, right? So there's some somewhere in this long text, there's a, a word that corresponds to Viagra, there's one that corresponds to cow, one that corresponds to potency, and so on. And you can see here, if I take this text up here, uh, and what I'm going to do is basically I'm just going to place the counts of the words. So, you know, so the word potency, there's a coordinate that corresponds to it. And I'll put a one there because it occurs in this text document here, or this text string. Similarly, Viagra occurs twice in this string up here. So I'll put a two in the coordinate corresponding to Viagra. I'm just counting how many times does this word occur in my text document. The word cow, there's also a coordinate corresponding to cow. There's no cows in my uh, text string up here. So that count is just going to be zero. So that's basically what the bag of words does. It just counts how many times each word occurs and it has a coordinate in the feature vector for each and every one of those possible words that could occur. And so each and every one of these entries just simply stores the count of how many times the corresponding word occurs in the text. Okay. So, so that's the bag of words representation. Uh, so you could also have another example of a, uh, of a string here. Also, someone uh, sending me spam. And again, right, if I want to do a back of word representation of this one, I'll just go to the words uh, corresponding to those that occur here. Who occurs? So I'll put a one in that coordinate. US dollars occurs. So I'll put a one in that coordinate. Investment occurs. So I'll put a one there. And abroad, I'll also put a one there. And I'll put zero in all the words that do not occur in the text. All right. So, so this at least allow give me some representation of a text string that has some information about what are the words in this text. All right. So, in some sense, right, if you think about it, documents that contain basically the same words, they will have very similar vector representations. And I guess you can already see that maybe this is useful for detecting spam, right? For instance, this coordinate before with the word Viagra is not something that you often send in a normal email. So, so probably that, that one feature, having that as a feature, as a count in your vector representation of a string uh, would actually be a good feature to have if you were to train a machine learning model to, to classify spam in, or not spam, right? All right, so these are different words that often tend to occur in spam emails, right? Viagra, cheap, donation, investment, US dollars, so forth, right? So we actually have features that still probably say a lot about whether this is a uh, spam email or a regular email, right? So, so it seems reasonable that at least this bag of words representation could be useful to train a classifier afterwards uh, on the data, okay? Uh, there's some a couple of observations. I'll just talk about a couple of tweaks you can do to this bag of words representation. And one observation here that's important is that uh, the order of the words in the input text that they don't matter, right? It's just a count of how many times each word occurs. And the problem is that it can sometimes miss the meaning of sentences. Maybe not for spam classification. Maybe it doesn't matter so much. But you know, maybe if you want to get further meaning out of the text, uh, here are two different texts that are actually very different in meaning. Uh, but have the same bag of word representation. Right? So the first one is she does not like Trump, she likes Biden. And the second one is she likes Trump, she does not like Biden. You can see that these two texts have exactly the same number of occurrences of every word. So they'll get exactly the same vector representation. So they have exactly, they, they are basically embedded to the same vector, even though the two texts have actually very different meanings. So so that's the one issue with bag of words. If actually it's important for your classification task, uh, what order the, the uh, words occur in, then you know maybe this naive bag of words might not be the best representation. Okay, so so this leads to kind of like an extension of bag of words representation. So the next 
I guess step up here is called two grams. And this is basically a technique for adding some order to the words. So the basic idea is here is that we'll kind of group all the words in the text uh, together, like every pair of consecutive words. And now my strings are gonna be even longer, like these feature vectors, sorry. The feature vector is gonna be very long. They're gonna be, it's gonna be a coordinate for every pair of words in the dictionary, right? So it's basically a size proportional to the, the I guess Cartesian product of the English dictionary with itself. So for every pair of words, that's gonna be a coordinate. So now when we have a text, what we're gonna do here is that, so now we have a, a coordinate for every pair of words in the dictionary. And these coordinates are gonna count how many times do these two words occur right after each other in the dictionary. And so they have to be consecutive in, or in, the, in the text, sorry. They have to be consecutive in the text for us to count it. So for instance, this text here, right? If I have this uh, spam mail here, I could take the two words, the amount, and then in somewhere in my feature vector, I'll have a coordinate corresponding to the amount. So I'll add an increment of one there. I also have a coordinate corresponding to valued at and with a and so forth. And also like the important thing is you also can you also consider the word amount is. I just kind of imagine sliding a window of two consecutive words. And for every two consecutive words, you count in the dictionary, uh, in the feature vector, you count how many times this, this, this pair of words occur in my text. And so that gives a another representation. And then here there's a little bit more order to the words, right? You actually do count uh, two consecutive words. Uh, so, so that's at least put more meaning to it. So value that might be this coordinate with a is here, the amount is here. So, you know, now we're at least trying to um, keep the structure, the order of the words a little bit. In general, you can go all the way up to n grams. So n grams is just a generalization where <clears throat> now you have a coordinate for every sequence of n words in the dictionary. Okay, so n consecutive words. And for instance, you could set n to be five. So then you would have five grams. So you take your text and then you take every five consecutive words. Uh, for instance, women and serving as a occurs in this text it's right here at women and serving as a. So this is five consecutive words. And well, this is sequence of five consecutive words occurs uh, basically it's a combination of five words from the dictionary. So we'll have a coordinate corresponding to those five words and we'll count one there. Similarly, right, we'll slide it. We also have and serving as a minister. This is also five consecutive words. It's all having with the first one, but we're going to do every consecutive five words. We're just going to count and increment the counter uh, in the corresponding coordinate of the feature vectors. Right, so, so this is one and another way of trying to keep even more of the order of the text. And so what should one keep in mind when you're doing this? Now, the issue with using a too small n, for instance, n equals one, the original bag of word representation is that, well, you're gonna lose the order of words. Now, you, can, you don't know anything about the order of words. And so maybe you'll meet, lose some of the meaning of the text. It could actually be important to, to know which order the things were, uh, were mentioned in, depending on the application, typically. If you have too large an n, that's also an issue. Uh, because then if you have a lot of different texts in your training data, if you have a too large N, right, you're going to group a lot of consecutive words. And then maybe all your texts, they don't even share any N grams, right? So all the training data just have disjoint places where the non-zeros in the feature vectors are. And if you don't have any overlap whatsoever, right, then it's basically going to be impossible to learn how to classify anything, right? If you only have a single training example that's non-zero in some uh, coordinate, probably you're not going to learn very much, right? So there has to be some overlap so you can see these texts are similar to these texts and these texts are somehow uh, different. So, so you have to balance uh, the choice of them. And I guess you can always try, and maybe you can use a validation data set to see what works best and so forth. Many of these different techniques that we've, we've tried. And also a, a typical thing that you try to do is uh, just to have as much data that looks as similar as possible is to maybe remove punctuations in the text. And also often you make everything lowercase just to not have two different words depending on uh, whether the word is capitalized or not, right? So, so this is also something that you do. Good. So when you do this, right, this the dictionary is quite long, right? So actually this means that maybe you have a lot of features, right? So these feature vectors become really, really long. For instance, in the English dictionary, there's around 171,000 words in the English dictionary. 
which means that if we have a chord and for every such word, right, we'll have 171,000 features in our feature vector. These are pretty big models, are pretty big uh, feature vectors that we're then going to feed into our learning algorithms. And this means that most of these learning algorithms will become very slow. Right? Just because if you know 171,000 features, typically the runtime, if you remember many of the algorithms we've seen, typically you know, scales with the number, both the N, the number of training examples, but also the D, the number of features. So they will become very slow. Also, some of the models that we've seen, the linear models, right, for classification, uh, we're talking about the VC dimension of these linear models is proportional to D, the number of features. And so this means that if you have 171,000 features, maybe we also have problems with generalization. And this gets even worse in some sense, right, if we look at pairs of words with the two grams, right, then the number of possible two grams is... 171,000 squared, so like 29 billion different two grams, right? So here is just completely impossible uh, to, you know, if you're just going to treat them completely naively as feature vectors, just have these super long strings, uh, then it's going to get very, very slow. Right? So in general, n grams, right, you raise it to the nth power, the possible number of different features. Okay. So, so there are a couple of things one can try and do to this. Uh, one observation is that the vectors, uh, here, in particular, in this extreme example here, they are very, very sparse, meaning that they have very few non-zeros. Uh, so here's another sp uh, spam email I received. And if you think about it, right, uh, even if I do three grams on this text, right, so every consecutive sequence of three words here correspond to all the lines I have down here. All these three grams, right, uh, there's not that many of them, actually. But if the text is n words long, and basically, if you think a little bit about it, if you look at n grams, there's m minus n plus one different uh, places that I have an n gram. Basically, I slide it by one every time, uh, starting at the beginning here, and then I cannot slide it past the end of it. That's why I subtract minus n plus one. So, so such a text has, if it has m words in the text, it's going to have a little bit less than m many n grams in it. So basically, uh, the number of non-zeros in the feature vector, right, the number of uh, n grams, it's going to be linear in the length of the text, right? So it's not that bad if the text is rather short. It means we have these very sparse vectors. Uh, in particular, right, if you look at the two grams, right, the, there was like 29 billion possible pairs of words in the English dictionary. But it's, it's, a text is never something like a hundred billions long in the number of words, and typically not at least. So, so what we're going to do is we're going to represent the feature vector in a different format than just writing down uh, like a huge vector with a few non-zeros. So what we can do is we can use several different sparse vector representations. One is to use an ordered list of non-zero entries. And the other one is to use the dictionary or hash map that map uh, strings like the n-grams that occur to a counter of how many times it's there. So let me just give an example of, of these two possible representations of sparse vectors. Right. So here's the text again um, that I received. And let's try to see these two sparse representations of such a, a text. Right. So here's the full feature vector. If I just write it down, uh, say, uh, you know, maybe it's uh, with n gram, with two grams, or just a single bag of words. Uh, but you have a lot of zeros in this representation. What you could do now, if you wanted to represent it as a list, an ordered list, then all you're going to do is just write down are these pairs that say are uh, the positions of the non-zeros in this huge vector sector. So, so coordinate two is going to be a one. So that represents this first coordinate here. Maybe coordinate 34,011 is also a one. Maybe that is the next one here and so on, right? This one writes down that coordinate 68,011 is, is one as well. So maybe that's this one here. So the first pair, the first entry of each of these pairs just gives the coordinate into the full feature vector and the second one gives the value of the coordinates. And basically, uh, all the zero coordinates you're not going to put in the list, right? So everything that's not in the list, you just assume is zero. You could also do it as a dictionary if you just have the text here. And you don't even want to bother about uh, constructing feature vectors and even talking about what indices they have. Like a very natural representation as a dictionary would just be to take all the the grams, the, the two grams, for instance, and just put them in the dictionary, all the ones that occur together with a count, like so say a dictionary, we shall occurs once, under A occurs once, and shall execute occurs once. Like you just take all these uh, two grams 
and put them in a dictionary storing the counts. Right? So these, this is another possible representation, not even having to bother about the length of the uh, of the possible you know full feature vector that you could have written down. So these are all the n-grams and the num and the counts of them in your text. Okay, so this is different representations of one of these text documents. But now the issue is that these representations do not actually match what our learning algorithms expect, right? All the algorithms we've seen, again, actually expects real feature vectors. We talked about these data matrices X, where we have the feature vectors as rows. And so, you know, maybe the algorithms break again now that we have these representations, right? Can we even use our algorithms? And fortunately, some of the algorithms still work, but not all of them. Okay, so let's try to see uh, some of those that actually work with these sparse representations. So the support vector machines uh, were one learning model that we saw early on, right? So here's an opt the optimization problem that one needed to solve. And right, so if you remember, uh, it's been a few, maybe, uh, I don't know, 10 videos ago or something, we're looking at this optimization problem, uh, the support vector machine in the kernel formulation, right? So there's something about choosing a vector of alpha i's that are non-zero, maximizing some expression here, subject to some constraints. And once you've done this, you compute a B in some way here, and then you make predictions using this expression down here. And if you remember this kernel function, this K here that takes two vectors as input, uh, the only thing it's supposed to do is to return the inner product between X i and X j. Um, perhaps uh, if you also you can also apply a feature transform to so the inner product after doing a feature transform, right? Uh, so you should go back and watch the the SVM videos if you've forgotten this. But the point is. To run this model, to train this model, uh, the only thing that you need here are the labels, the y's of the labels, right? Alphas are just parameters of the optimization problem. So the only thing that depends on the data that you need to be able to compute, that depends on the feature vectors at least, are their inner products, right? So that's what we have here, inner products between feature vectors. If you can just compute these inner products, then you can run the support vector machine. And actually, uh, we can do this if we have these sparse vector representations of the text documents, then we can actually compute these inner products efficiently, meaning we can actually run the support vector machine uh, algorithm. So, so let's try to have a look. And also, if you remember, there's also a regularized version of the support vector machine where there's also an upper bound on the alpha i's, and all of that's the same. We can still run it. Uh, so that corresponds to support vector machines with a hinge loss. So all of it still works. And let's now, so that, that's, see now that if I have two different vectors uh, using one of these representations, uh, then I can actually compute the inner product efficiently, even if I carry around these list of dictionary representations of the vectors. And if I can do this, then I can actually run support vector machines and train my classifier uh, using these representations. So, so let's say here I have two sparse vectors and I'd like to compute the inner product. And let's say I've represented both of them uh, in these list representations. So just a list of the non-zeros in a sorted order, including a count of how many times each of these words occur, right? So the first one here represents the first text, or the first long sparse vector. So position two is one, position 34,000 and something is one, position 68,000 and something is one. The second string here, the position two is two, as you can see here. And okay, I guess also position three is one. And then you have some other positions here. Right? So it's just a list of all the, the positions. Okay, so I guess this one technically, there should have been a position three comma one here. Sorry about that, that uh, should have been there. What you're gonna do now, if you have these two representations of your text, you're gonna scan them from the front to the end. So let's see how that goes. So here's a little bit shorter strings where I have the full representation. So the first one here, position two is one, Position seven is one, position nine is one. The second string over here, position two is two, position three is one, position six is one, seven is one, eight is one. And so these are the sparse representations of these two vectors. And let's now see that I can compute the inner product from these sparse representations. And the way we're gonna do it is we're gonna scan the two lists from the front to the end. And while we're doing so, I uh, will always examine the element that we're looking at that has the smallest position. So let's try to see this. So you start, basically you think of it that you have a point or an arrow at the beginning of each of the lists, and then you compare them. And while you're kind of scanning these lists, you'll keep a running sum of the inner products. So let's see. So, so far, when we start out, the inner product is zero. And now what we do is 
um, we're going to look at these first two position, positions and we're going to compare them. So here we see that these correspond to the same coordinates, so coordinate two and coordinate two. One of them is one, the other is two, which basically, we, you know, we're looking at the second coordinate in the first vector and the second coordinate in the second vector. They have the same coordinates, so actually in the inner product, these two have to be multiplied. So you multiply one with two, and we add it to the inner product. So now we're up to two. So what we do now is we move the pointers forward. Uh, we have done with processing coordinate two. Now what we're looking at here is coordinate three against coordinate seven. So here there's a mismatch in the coordinates. So what we do is just we, we look at the smallest of the two coordinates, coordinate three, and then we just see that they have different coordinates. So coordinate three is actually not matched to anything. So we just kind of move the point of forward in the list with the smallest uh, coordinate. Coordinate six against seven, six is still smaller. So we uh, see that they have different coordinates and we just move the smallest one forward. Now we have coordinate seven against coordinate seven. This time there's a match. So now we're basically looking at the seventh coordinate here against the seventh coordinate up here. They are both one, as we see here in the lists. So we multiply one with one and add it to the inner product. So this means that the inner product is incremented to three. We move both of them forward. Now we're comparing coordinate eight to coordinate nine. Coordinate eight is smaller, so we increment that one. And now we're past the list. So now you know there's no more matches and, and we're done. So then we just return the value of this inner product uh, when we're done here. And clearly the running time, as you see here, is linear in the length of the lists, right? Uh, we just scan the lists from one end to another. In the worst case, we're gonna scan both of them. So it's gonna be linear in the sum of A plus B, the length of the two lists. And the length of the list is just proportional to the number of non-zeros. And if we remember again, a few slides ago, uh, the number of non-zeros is just proportional to the length of the text that they're representing if it's bag of words. Uh, so, so it's just proportional, the, the time to compute the inner product is just proportional to scan through the text, which I think is very desirable here. So for the lists, it takes basically the length of the two lists time to compute the inner product. If you want to do use the dictionaries, uh, I guess it's this very simple exercise to show that you can actually compute the inner product in time proportional to the shortest of the two lists, the minimum of the size of A and size of B. Right? So it's not too hard to show. Now, support vector machines, we just saw that we can run. And basically, all the models that rely on inner products between feature vectors, all those models we can, we can run. And if you remember, the perceptron learning algorithm was also such an example. But unfortunately, these sparse representations do not always help. If we think about neural nets, like the neural nets already when we go to the second layer, right? They are typically, they have a neuron for every feature vector. And then again, on the next layer, these are fully connected neural nets. They have an, a, an edge to all the incoming neurons, right? So, so here you cannot really use the sparsity of the input uh, to your advantage, right? So we'll try to see uh, in one of the next videos um, techniques for addressing this so that we can also use neural nets on, on text. Just see the basic techniques. There are more advanced ones that we will not be covering.